Hi everyone, so I am here to bring you a lovely booktube video. So, I was tagged by Todd the Librarian and basically what this is, is I take books that I like obviously and read you their opening paragraph. So for me, a lot of the time, the opening lines is, the opening lines are what really makes me want to continue with the book. That opening line can really give you a sense of the writing style, the voice of the character, um, you know, whether it's between first or um, third person narrative. And you might get a sense of maybe the age it's aimed at or just how the overall feeling of the book is going to go. Now, there are plenty of books that I, the beginning was okay, but I continued on with the book because it was still good, but then there are ones that really seem interesting. And there could be a lot on this list. And, of course, my favorite trilogy is going to be on here, so that should be no surprise. And, yes, there will be the three. Unfortunately, I'm not going to be doing them in order because they're not in order in the pile here, so we're just going to go with it. So some of them I have physically here and some of them I will be reading off on. So here goes. I will start with the first one. Mr. and Mrs. Dursley of number four Privet, Privet Drive were proud to say that they were perfectly normal, thank you very much. They were the last people you'd expect to be involved in anything strange or mysterious because they just did not hold with such nonsense. Mr. Dursley was the director of a firm called Grunnings, which made drills. He was a big, beefy man with hardly any neck. Although he did have a very large mustache, Mrs. Dursley was, a thin, was thin and blonde and he had nearly twice the usual amount of neck, which came in very useful as she spent much of her time craning over garden fences, spying on the neighbors. The Dursleys had a small son called Dudley, and in their opinion he was and in their opinion there was no finer boy anywhere. So that is from Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, which is the first book in the Harry Potter series. And uh you know, for those of you who have watched and have watched the movies and read the books I almost forgot that his aunt was blonde because she's not in the movies. So, I think I'm going to go back and forth between the online and my physical books here. Or I'm just going to do whatever the hell I want. So, on to the next book. Now that we've read the greatness that is Harry Potter. The screw, the screw through Cinder's ankle had rusted. The engraved cross marks worn to a mangled circle. Her knuckles ached from forcing the screwdriver into the joint as she struggled to loosen the screw, one grinning twist after another. By the time it was extracted far enough for her to wrench free with her prosthetic steel hand, the hairline thread had been stripped clean. Tossing the screwdriver onto the table, Cinder gripped, Cinder gripped her heel and yanked the foot from its socket. A spark singed from her fingertips and she jerked away, leaving the foot to dangle from a tangle of red and yellow wires. She slumped back with a relieved groan. A sense of relief hovered at the end of those loose wires. Freedom. Having loathed the too small foot for four years, she swore to never put the piece of junk back on. She just hoped Iko would be back with his replacement soon. Okay, so that one's a little bit more than a paragraph, but um, Cinder is fantastic, and it is Cinder and Marissa Meyer, which is the first in the Lunar Chronicles. On to the next one.
Okay. I'm going to have to give an adjustment here for a second. Because I do not put this on far enough. There we go. All right. The monster showed up just after midnight, as they do. Connor was awake when it came. He had a nightmare. Well, not a nightmare, the nightmare. The one he had been having a lot lately, the one with the darkness and the wind and the screaming. The one with the hand slipping from his grasp, no matter how hard he tried to hold. The one that ended with, go away, Connor whispered into the darkness of his bedroom, trying to push the nightmare back. Not let it follow him into the world of the waking. Go away now. So that is A Monster Calls, which I read in my nook. I want to get uh, the actual physical copy with the pictures and everything because um, that one was a really good one. It's more middle grade-ish, but still a really good book. And just that whole um, beginning, I love that. The monster came at midnight as they do. It was such, oh God, so heartbreaking. Now, I shall read you for a little bit more classic dystopian here. It was a bright, cold day in April, and the clocks were striking 13. Winston Smith, his chin nuzzled into his breast in an effort to escape the vile wind, slipped quickly through the glass door of the Victory Mansions, though not quickly enough to prevent a swirl of gritty dust from entering along with him. The hallway smelled of boiled cabbage and old rag mats. At the end of it, a colored poster, too large for an indoor display, had been tacked to the wall. It depicted simply an enormous face, more than a meter wide, the face of a man about 45, with heavy, with a heavy black mustache, and ruggedly handsome features. Winston made for the stairs. It was no use trying the lift. Even in the best of times, it was seldom working, and at the present, electric current was off, was cut off during daylight hours. It was part of the economy drive in preparation for the hate week, for hate week. So, it goes on a little bit more, but this is very small print, but I was definitely enjoying this book, like I said, I want to uh, read as much dystopian as I can this year, and we will see if I can start doing recommendation videos, because I want to do them for different genres, fantasy, etc. But that is Orwell's 1984. So... And to the next one. It was almost December, and Jonas was beginning to, was beginning to be frightened. No, wrong word, Jonas thought. Frightened meant that deep, sickening feeling of something terrible about to happen. Frightened was the way he had felt years ago when an unidentified aircraft had flown over the community. He had seen it both times, squinting towards the sky. He had seen the sleek jet. Almost blur, almost a blur, as its high speed go past. A second later, heard, and a second later, heard the blast of sound that followed. Then one more time, a moment later, from the opposite direction, the same plane. At first, he had been fascinated. He had only been fascinated. He had never seen an aircraft so close, for it was against the rules for pilots to fly over the community. So that is the opening to The Giver by Lois Lowry, which, again, is considered another dystopian, but it's more middle grade. But it is a fantastic book for something so short. Ugh. One of my absolute favorites. Now to read my favorite series, Out of Order. Why? Because I just do stuff like that. 
I stare down at my shoes, watching as a fine layer of ash settles on the worn leather. This is where the bed I shared with my sister Prim stood. Over there was the kitchen table, the bricks of the chimney which collapsed in, in a charred heap. Provide a point of reverence, of reference for the rest of the house. How else could I orient myself in the sea of gray? Almost nothing remains of District 12. A month ago, the Capitol's firebombs obliterated the poor, the poor coal miners' house in the seam, houses in the seam. The shops in the town, even the Justice Building. The only area that escaped incineration was the Victor's Village. I don't know why exactly, perhaps so anyone forced to come here on Capitol business would have somewhere decent to stay. And that is... Mockingjay. Then comes my favorite of all. When I wake up, the other side of the bed is cold. My fingers stretch out, seeking Prim's warmth, but finding only the rough canvas cover of the mattress. She must have had bad dreams and climbed in bed with her mother. Of course she did. This is the day of the reaping. I prop myself up on one elbow. There's enough light in the bedroom to see them. My little sister, Prim, curled up on her side, cocooned in my mother's body. Their cheeks pressed together. In sleep, my mother looks younger. Still worn, but not so beaten down. Prim's face is fresh as a raindrop, as lovely as the primrose for which she was named. My mother was very beautiful once, too. Or so they tell me. So that is what hooked me on my absolute favorite book. And I have another book that I will be reading, which was a standalone, which was probably the first, first, like, opening book or opening chapter that just hooked me onto a book. So this one and the one that I will be reading last are probably my two favorites of all time. And this is the second book in the series. I clasp, I clasp the, fa the flask. Oh my God, I can't read. Between my hands, even though the warmth from the tea has long since leached into the, into the frozen air, my muscles are clenched tight against the cold. If a pack of wild dogs were to appear at this moment, the odds of scaling a tree before they attacked are not in my favor. I should get up, move around, and work the stiffness from my limbs, but instead I sit, mo I sit motionless as the rock beneath me while the dawn begins to lighten the woods. I can't fight the sun. I can only helplessly watch as it drags me into a day that I have been dreading for months. And that is Catching Fire, which is one of the best sequels, I think. And I was going to go back and forth, but because those, that is a series, I just read those, you know, together. So, on to the last book, and then there's going to be the last one on here. Because I couldn't find my copy. Merrick, no. The best day of my life happened when I was five... Yeah, the best day of my life happened when I was five and almost died at Disney World. I'm 16 now, so you can imagine that's left me with quite a few days of major suckage. Like career day? Really? Do we need to devote an entire six hours of high school, of the high school year to having life counselors tell you all the jobs you can potentially blow at? There's a reason for, is there a reason for dodgeball, pep rallies? Soda commercial featuring Parker Day's smug, tanned face. I ask you. But back to the best day of my life, Disney, and my near-death experience. I know what you're thinking. WTF. Who dies at Disney World? It's full of spinning teacups and magical princesses and big-ass chipmunks walking around and waving like... 
It's absolutely normal for jumbo-sized stuffed animals to come to life and pose for photo ops. Like, seriously. So that was the beginning of Going Bovine by Libba Bray. Um, this book... Uh, I mean, honestly, like I said before, look, look at... Look at the cover. Like, you shouldn't judge a book by his cover most of the time. But it, it just has a fantastic opening, uh, great characters, and an, an amazingly um, interesting and hilarious cover. And I found this at Goodwill, I think. So, because obviously uh, hardbacks are usually pretty, um, pretty expensive. Yeah, I just love that book. Oh my god. So the very last one, the one I read a few years ago, and it just hooked me from the beginning. My name was Susie, like the fish. No, my name was Salmon, like the fish. First name Susie. There's no fish name Susie. I was 14 years old when I was murdered on December 6, 1973. In the newspaper photos of missing girls from the 70s, most looked like me, white girls with mousy brown hair. This was before kids of all races and genders started to appear in mail cartons or the Daily Mail. It was still back when people believed things like this didn't happen. So that is the first part of The Lovely Bones and this book is just heart-wrenching and beautiful. The movie was good, but just the flow, the prose of this book, it, it's told in first person as you can see about this girl whose life has been taken from her and her family that falls apart. Just I, I just think the whole book had just such lovely writing for such an ugly topic. and. So, those are some of my favorite openings from books I have enjoyed, and I hope you enjoyed this video, and I tag everyone watching this. Anyways, thanks for watching, guys. Bye-bye.